Jill P. Carter, Maryland's House of Delegates 41st District Representative, is known as the legacy. Jill is no stranger to trouble. Even though her life didn't start out that way, Jill was born and raised in Ashburton, a middle-class section of Baltimore City. Her mother, Zarita Joy Richardson Carter, was a school teacher, and her father was civil rights leader Walter P. Carter. Let's listen to how Jill describes growing up in Ashburton. My childhood in Baltimore was, was for lack of a better word, great. Um, of course, I, I, went to, I grew up in Ashburton. Um, my father had bought a house through auction. I'm told now, a house in Ashburton, my mother says he paid $7,000 for it in Ashburton. And when they moved in, it was still a mixed neighborhood. And um, so, you know, it was a, it was a really, some, some of my friends have joked over the years and said, I lived in a, a black leave it to beaver neighborhood. And it's pretty true. I mean, you know, no crime, so-called middle class neighborhood. And um, it was very safe. Mother was super protective and so, uh, and, and, and a great mother. So I really had a wonderful childhood. Um, of course, with the exception of the, the pivotal episode of my life with the tragedy of my father dying when I was seven. Um, but, you know, absent that tragedy, and it was a tragedy because I, I, still, I still feel that I'm recovering from it. It, it, it. it takes a lifetime to recover from the loss of a, a father, especially someone so strong and powerful as he was. Carter received her primary education from Weston High School before going on to obtain a BA in English from Loyola College in 1988 and her JD from the University of Baltimore Law School in 1992. You know, high school for me was, I think, well, m many teenagers are awkward and, and, and struggle, but I, 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 when I think of my um, teenage years, I really think of isolation, I think of loneliness, and um, I went to Western in the ninth grade in the A course, and I was very happy to be going there because, you know, it was like a badge of honor to be accepted to Western in the ninth grade in the A course. So it was what I really wanted to do. But I found that when I got there, I didn't, I didn't feel the camaraderie that I, I, I think I thought I would feel. I also didn't, that's a time when you really try to establish who you are. And so I was looking for my who-ness and who was around me like me. And that's when I really realized I can't find anyone around me like me. And what I mean is that that's when I realized it had been a number of years at that point when my father died. And, you know, when he died... I struggled with um, that a lot, but I also believed that I, the one thing that was ingrained in me from my, my life and, and the lessons of my father was that we were all here for a purpose greater than ourselves. And so in high school, I really struggled with, you know, being excited about the normal teenage things. I wasn't, I couldn't really get excited about track meets and I couldn't get excited about poly discos. I couldn't get excited about proms even or the things that all of my friends were very excited about, I always felt there's something missing, there's something missing, but we're, I, what about, what about liberation? What about power? When is that gonna happen? And I was like beginning to realize that the world was kind of moving on, um, probably from the civil rights movement and definitely the black power movement, but for me, it was leaving my father behind and it was very sad to me. Carter was a journalist for the Afro-American newspaper prior to attending law school. She was admitted to the Maryland Bar in 1993. Her vast work experience includes staff attorney for the Legal Aid Bureau, the Office of the Public Defender, and the Office of the City Solicitor. She is a member of the Monumental City Bar Association, the Maryland Trial Lawyers Association, and a founding member of the Black Lawyers Group and founder and president of the Walter P. Carter Foundation. Well, I went to law school just, you know, saying to God, please, God, just let me be in with everyone else. I don't have to do well. <laughs> just don't let me fail because I looked at it as this is my ticket uh, to a life of, of being able to provide for myself. I had worked, um, I had worked, um, you know, in, in jobs that didn't pay very well, part-time jobs in college. And then um, around that time, I was, I was a reporter at the Afro and trying to work and go to school and the, the pay was very low and I love being a journalist but I wanted an ability to make money for myself and so law school was very important to me initially for that reason and also I think inside I wanted to prove to myself that I wasn't dumb because after Loyola and the great issue I, I felt I began to question whether I was really an intelligent person and um, and so it was important to me to, to just not fail out initially but then I realized that um, wow finally 
we're studying all the things that I care about. Like, we're studying things about constitutional rights. And finally, academics is connecting with what, with purpose. And, and I, I began to feel, one, I, was, I was happy. I was very, very happy. I actually, for the first time since probably elementary school, loved to learn. I loved to read. I loved to learn. And I began to have fantasies about becoming a great lawyer like Thurgood Marshall and, and, and arguing cases before the Supreme Court. She was the executive director of the Maryland Minority Business Association in 2002, chair of the Baltimore branch of the NAACP Legal Redress Committee, and was listed in Maryland's top 100 women in the Daily Record in 2006. In 2009, she was honored as an exceptional woman in business and government at the first annual Pretty in Pinstripes Women's History Month celebration. The first time that I ran was, was really the most miraculous time of all because it was an unprecedented and historic victory in local politics. Um, and it was a combination of a number of things. One, I had, um, although it was small, I had some kind of a support system that was able to give me some resources and, and help me run a grassroots campaign. Um, the second thing is I had a father's name, Walter Carter, that resonated with older people and not just black, but many people, black, white, Jewish, Asian, in Baltimore, that were alive and, and the few that are still alive from the, that time, um, they remember Walter Carter and the emotional response that I've gotten from m people uh, diverse, um, notwithstanding race, when they truly remember him and what he represented um, is still moving. So there were some of this, that was there, that was a factor. And then also um, I, I was, uh, I, I knocked on doors and I did the traditional things that you're supposed to do. And I, I was excited about my campaign. I was having fun and people had fun. And I, when I asked people all the time, like, why did you vote for me? I wanted it to be, well, you were so wonderful. You had great credentials. I loved what you said. I loved what your, your platform was. But more often than not, the, res the overwhelming response was because you worked so hard. You wanted it so much that we believed that if you wanted it that much that you would be good at it. During Jill's first term from 2003 to 2006, she was the only African-American female attorney serving in the House of Delegates. She's currently a member of the House Judiciary Committee and the chair of the Estates and Trusts Subcommittee. I was only the third black female attorney ever in the General Assembly. And then in addition to that, no one had had the combination of the civil rights background or been, been my age, as young as I was at the time, and then elected without the machine. And so it was just this, this phenomenon, really, that, that they hadn't seen before. Um, and just, just moving along on that, the second time that I talked in committee, you could hear a pin drop. And it's, it's like that to this day. Um, when I speak, and, and it's clear that I'm saying something, because I don't, I don't over speak, I don't talk all the time. I talk only when it's necessary. So people know, people will have a tendency to listen. And then started, and, that, and that's when, frankly, that's when everything kind of began to change, where the, the mantra kind of became, because they had someone, the people in power now deemed me to be a threat. I blocked something that they wanted to do, and I did it for no reason other than it was the right thing to do. I didn't have children, I, you know, I, I just, you know, wanted to, to, things to be right and fair. Um, there came a point when the speaker attempted to remove me from a committee and strip me of a subcommittee chairmanship because I had spoken out about um, DNA, a DNA bill. I, I wanted fairness, and I, I didn't think everybody that got arrested should be forced to give a DNA and be forever in the database locally or nationally. And I got a little support from two great, uh, my, my favorite people, two of my favorite people in the legislature, which is um, Delegate Aisha Braveboy and, and Delegate Pena Melnick and also happened to be black female attorneys um, that came later. And the response of the speaker was to, without the consent of my chairman, remove me so that I could have no ability to affect policy or to interfere with the program again. Well, people stood up and that didn't happen, but I remember, not all, but some of the more veteran black women in the legislature came to me and said, well, not some, one in particular that stood out is one of the 
um, more seasoned um, black women in the legislature came to me and said, you know, don't make this about you. Um, just go and, and log and do what they say. You know, you don't always have to grandstand and, and make waves. And when I got here, black women, not no, not just black women, women, many women initially in the legislature weren't even assigned to committees. And then black women um, had to, women have always had to struggle and fight to get heard and be on committees. Um, and so, but my response, of course, was, well, wasn't the reason that you guys went through that is because to, to make it better for us and, and, and my going through what I've got to go through and fighting for, for my, uh, for justice, but also for my humanity and my right to be here and my right to be treated as a, the same equal at the same level of equality as any of my counterparts, male, female, white, black, whatever, isn't that supposed to, what I'm supposed to do, my responsibility to make it better for the people that come after me. So it's not, I didn't make it about me. It was the governor and the speaker who made it about me when they said I didn't have a right to speak out um, and, and stay on a committee and, and be treated fairly. And, and it's interesting because that mentality shocks me, but that was the mentality and pretty much the consensus of many people that, you know, you can, you, as long as you endure injustice, you're doing the right thing, but as soon as you speak against it, somehow you're the problem. Well In 2008, Carter was the only member of the Baltimore City State's delegation to receive a grade of outstanding from the local NAACP. When I was, you know, growing up or getting educated, becoming a lawyer, you should leave Baltimore. So, so people would say, there's nothing for you here. And I would say, what do you mean? Baltimore is everything to me. Baltimore represented um, the best people, the, the, the struggle to me, the, the struggle for freedom to me, and, and the wonderful upbringing that I had, wonderful teachers, wonderful education, wonderful community. I knew, I know, I knew and continue to know beautiful, beautiful people and families here. But what I realize is that there has not been a glue that kind of brings out the people or the, 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 the that, that best of people um, and connects them with how we lead a, another struggle to really fix a lot of the right a lot right a lot of the wrongs. We continue to have the worst political condition that I can fathom, except for maybe some some places in Africa um, that are just you know more blatantly corrupt than this city. And and I'm not pointing pointing the finger at any particular person or group, but it, it's not even the politicians. It's, it's kind of an acceptable way of of, of a, a modus operandi of our po political system where, you know, a person is selected and put out in front and given all of the machine support and the real agenda is never the person. It's just they know that the person isn't going to make waves so that the, 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 the wealthy people and the paternalists that run our entire city are going to be able to do business as usual. And anyone that's going to put a wrinkle in that is somehow never allowed to get to that position, including me. Um, you know, I once had aspirations to be the mayor and fix everything in Baltimore, and I still to this day, I still to this day to believe that I am the person or was the person that could right many of the wrongs in Baltimore and create a better city for everyone.